We made peace a symbol of ours In the name of peace we gather here now All praise is due to Allah, we praise Him, we seek His help and we ask for His forgiveness We take refuge with Allah from the evil of ourselves and from the evil consequence of our evil actions Whomsoever Allah guides, there is none to misguide and whomsoever Allah leaves to go astray, there is none to guide. And today, over the next series of programs, we are going to be doing our best to prove to you that that is the case, that indeed there is nothing worthy of worship except Allah, and that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the messenger of Allah. And today, we are going to be talking about the preservation of the Qur'an. Now, why are we going to be talking about the preservation of the Qur'an? Why is that important? And what has that got to do with proving that Islam is the truth? Well, I think from one angle, it's a very important issue. Because if we are going to say that one of the evidences that we're going to put forward to show that Islam is indeed from Allah, the creator of the heavens and the earth, is the Qur'an. And the things that the Qur'an says are a type of, or constitute type of evidence, then a person may quite rightly ask, well, how do we know the Qur'an is authentic? And to be perfectly honest, this is one of the issues that Muslims themselves bring up with, for example, the Bible, or the Vedas, or the teachings of Buddha, or anyone else. One of the issues that we have is that, okay, well you claim these things are from this teacher, or are from God, or whatever, but prove it. How can we be sure that your scriptures are authentic? They Maybe they have been corrupted, maybe they have been distorted. Maybe there is some truth there, and some falsehood there. So, what we would like to do today, is to do our best to show that the Qur'an is indeed a book that has been preserved from corruption and from distortion. So this is really a very, very important issue from one angle, because then when a person hears that something is from the Qur'an, or indeed for that matter, that something is from the Prophet Muhammad, and it has been authenticated as being from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, then you can be sure that this is something authentic, this is something verified, this is something that, not ha that has not been changed and corrupted over time. So this gives us a lot of confidence that what we're mentioning from the Qur'an is indeed something that is true, and something that is correct. So, um, that is what we're going to be dealing with. But inshallah, before we do that, we would just like to recap on something very important that we mentioned in a previous series of programs. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, my dear brothers and sisters, one of the strongest proofs and evidences that Islam is from Allah is what the Qur'an teaches about Allah. Now we have already mentioned this and we've been through this in another series of programs, but I want to go through it again, very briefly, without repeating everything. You see, the Qur'an has a very beautiful teaching about God. And in fact, if this was the only thing that the Qur'an was teaching, the oneness of God, the uniqueness of God, the transcendence of Allah. If this was the only thing the Qur'an was teaching, really for a person who is very logical and rational, and who is really in touch with their nature and their inner selves, then for them, that probably would be enough of a proof and evidence that the Qur'an is from God. Because what we find is that nearly every religion in some way or another way distorts the belief in the oneness of God in some way or another. For example, Christianity. 
teaches that there is one God, that there is one Creator who has brought this whole universe into existence. In one way or another, this idea is corrupted by the idea or the concept that, for example, as Christianity teaches, that God has become man and that somehow Jesus is both human and God. So this is really a corruption and a distortion of the pure teachings of monotheism. Because in reality what we find is that this is a type of impossibility. How can something be completely human and completely divine at the same time? Because the qualities of true divinity and the qualities of true humanity are incompatible. God is eternal, whereas human beings are finite. God is self-sufficient, whereas human beings are needy. How can something be eternal and be finite at the same time? How can something be self-sufficient and needy at the same time? You see, this is the problem. So, any religion that teaches that God is a man or that God is like some created thing, really, how can we accept that to be true? Because when it's talking about God, it is already upon a type of corruption and a distortion and a falsehood. Whereas Islam is free from this type of thing. The things that Islam teaches about God are really very rational and very reasonable. And this is one of the strongest reasons for believing that the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what we want to emphasize upon today, my dear brothers and sisters, may Allah have mercy upon you, may Allah guide us, all of us, closer to the truth, is the issue of the preservation of the Qur'an. Now, one of the things that I want to touch upon is the historical evidence of the preservation of the Qur'an. But another thing I want to introduce is why this is itself a type of miraculous concept. Why it is really a type of amazing thing. Why the preservation of the Qur'an itself is one of the proofs, or one of the evidences, rather, it's more accurate to say one of the evidences, because proof is one, evidences are many. One of the evidences that the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator of the heavens and the earth. So let's go into a little bit about the historical preservation of the Qur'an. Now according to traditional Muslim sources, according to the teachings of the hadith, the teachings of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and those people who came after him, the Sahaba and the Tabi'een, um, the way that the Qur'an was preserved, at least in terms of writing, because there are two ways that the Qur'an has been preserved. It has been preserved partially through writing. Now, mostly in Western culture, for example, a lot of emphasis and a lot of importance is given to the preservation in writing. Whereas, in fact, it is not necessarily true that something has been written down in a scriptural form and that we have something written down in a scriptural way is necessarily the most authentic thing. Anyway, inshallah, brothers and sisters, we're going to get back to that. But now we're going to have a short break, inshallah, and I will be back with you in a few minutes to talk about the historical preservation of the Qur'an. We make peace a symbol of ours. In the name of peace we gather. Assalamu alaikum brothers and sisters. Welcome back to the proof that Islam is the truth. And today we're talking about the preservation of the Qur'an. And I just wanted to read an ayah from the Qur'an. Verily, we have revealed the dhikr, the reminder, which is one of the words for the Qur'an. And verily upon us, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, upon us is the preservation of it. This is a promise in the Qur'an that Allah will preserve the Qur'an. And the reality of the preservation of the Qur'an is without doubt one of the miraculous aspects of the Qur'an and one of the proof, the proofs and the evidences that it is from 
Allah. In fact, you will find that nearly every type of book and scripture and writing through time goes through many alterations and distortions and corruptions. Now this may not be the case so much today with the invention of the printing press, but of course in ancient times when books were largely transcribed by scribes, then there was a lot of opportunity for corruptions and distortions and additions and deletions to take place. Yet throughout the 1,400 years of Islamic history, the Qur'an has remained the same. In fact, it is one of the most remarkable things that you could take a copy of the Qur'an today. You could take a copy of the Qur'an today. So for example, if we took this Qur'an here, if we took this Qur'an here, and we looked at the Arabic, so this is of course an English Arabic Qur'an, but if you looked at the Qur'an today, and you took this Qur'an, and you compare it with a Qur'an in Saudi Arabia, and you compare it with a Qur'an in Morocco, and you compare it with a Qur'an in China, and you compare it with a Qur'an in Siberia, and even if you went back in history, 100 years, 500 years, 1000 years, 1200 years, in fact, the most ancient manuscripts that we have of the Qur'an date to a time that is almost contemporaneous to the time of the Prophet It means we have manuscripts of the Qur'an dating back all the way back to the time of the Prophet And the amazing thing is that if you examined these manuscripts, you would find that the actual words of the Qur'an are exactly the same. Okay, the style of writing may be different. The use of certain diacritical marks may be different. But the actual words remain exactly the same. This is a fact. Actually, this is one of the greatest arguments against those people who claim. There are some people who are trying to claim that the Qur'an has evolved, it's an evolved text. They're trying to make the same claims about the Qur'an that have been discovered about the Bible. But no one or very few people take these claims really seriously. And part of the reason is, is that the sheer weight of evidence against such a claim is there. Because we have these texts of the Qur'an, and we have different manuscripts in places like, for example, Tashkent, uh, we have manuscripts in Cairo, we have manuscripts in Yemen, we have very, very ancient manuscripts that date really to the time, very close to the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Let's go very briefly through the history of the written preservation of the Qur'an. Now, of course, during the lifetime of Rasulullah wasallam. The Qur'an was never actually collected as one book. And the reason for that, of course, is that as long as the Prophet ﷺ was alive, it was still possible that some more verses of the Qur'an would be revealed. However, the Prophet ﷺ, he used to recite the Qur'an from beginning to end every Ramadan. And in the Ramadan before he died, the Prophet ﷺ recited the Qur'an twice. And the angel Gabriel, Jibreel, used to come and go through the Qur'an with the Prophet ﷺ in the month of Ramadan. So the Qur'an was known from Surah Al-Fatiha to Surah Al-Nas. It was known by the people who used to memorize the Qur'an and what was known as the Qur'an was understood, but it was never written down as what is called a mushaf. They wrote down the Qur'an in various pieces and fragments, but it was never written down as one book. However, after the Prophet ﷺ died, there were what was called the wars of Ridda. These are the wars of apostasy, when many people began to apostatize and leave the religion of Islam. And there were some wars against those people. 
And in those wars, many of those people who had memorized the entire Qur'an, who were known as the Hufaz, the memorizers or the preservers from Hafiz, which means to preserve in Arabic, these people had preserved and memorized the entire Qur'an in their memory. We will get back to that at a later stage about the oral transmission and memorization of the Qur'an. But now we're talking about the written preservation of the Qur'an. So these people, many of them, were killed in battle. So it was said to Abu Bakr, who was the ruler of the Muslims, the first caliph or the first ruler of the Muslims. Some people said to him, why don't you write down the Qur'an to make sure that we don't suffer from what the people suffered from who came before us, meaning the Jews and Christians, from their distortions and the corruptions in their text. Because we're afraid that if the Hufaz are killed in great numbers, then maybe the preservation of the Qur'an will not be maintained. So anyway, there was some dispute about this because some of them said, well, how can we do something that the Prophet ﷺ never did? But they agreed, and Umar and Abu Bakr, having discussed it with each other, they agreed, and the companions had agreed that this was a good idea. So what they did is they got someone called Zayd ibn Thabit. They got him to organize this collection of the Qur'an, and with the agreement of those people who were the Hufaz who were still living, they agreed to collect the Qur'an, and to write it as one mushaf from the beginning to the end. And they got a unanimous decision about that. In fact, they got an agreement on every single ayah. Two people, a minimum of two people had to agree. Every single ayah of the Qur'an, they had to agree that this was the right ayah and it was in the right place also. So this was the first mushaf. And it stayed with Abu Bakr. And then when Abu Bakr died, it was given to Umar. And when Umar died, he gave it to his daughter, Hafsa. Hafsa was also one of the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. Now, after the death of Umar, the Islam had spread over many, many different lands. Islam had entered into Persia, it had entered into Egypt, and there were so many people becoming Muslim. Now, some of the people began to argue with each other, about the reading of the Qur'an. Because the Prophet ﷺ, and it's very important, he had allowed the Qur'an to be read in seven different dialects. So there were seven different dialects. They were all considered to be the Qur'an. And the Prophet allowed the reading of the Qur'an in those seven different dialects. However, some of the people who read it in one dialect began to argue with those who read it in another dialect and they were saying, our reading is the right reading and your reading is the wrong reading and vice versa. And they nearly came to blows over this issue. So one of the generals came to Uthman ibn Affan and said, look, this is a problem. Let us unite the people under one reading and this way we will avoid dissension and controversy. So Uthman, he said, okay, this is a good idea. What we will do is we will unite the people under the reading of the Qur'ayshi dialect. The Qur'ayshi dialect was the dialect that the Prophet ﷺ, he used to use the most often. Okay, this was the dialect the Prophet ﷺ himself used to use. So once again, he ordered a compilation of the Qur'an. And who did he get? The same Zayd ibn Thabit. They got the same Zayd ibn Thabit to make a compilation of the Qur'an. And once again, he got a total agreement for each ayah. A minimum of two people had to agree about this ayah, that it was correct and that its placement in the Qur'an was correct. And once again, they made a compilation of the text of the Qur'an. Then they compared this new compilation with the compilation that had been made by Abu Bakr. And they found that the two corresponded exactly. They were both corresponding exactly one with the other. So then Uthman ordered that every copy 
that people had made and every writing that people have made of the Qur'an should be destroyed. And the way that they destroyed it was by burning it, okay? This is considered to be a clean and pure way to destroy the text of the Qur'an. Not like in maybe in <laughs> Western culture these days, you know, when they want to get rid of books, they burn the books as a type of protest. No, this was considered to be a clean way to dispose of the Qur'an. So every Qur'an they had was either washed as the mushaf that was given to uh, from Abu Bakr and Umar to Hafsa, it was actually washed clean. And every type of copy of the Qur'an was destroyed except this, what is called the Imam manuscript. That was the Imam manuscript compiled by Uthman under the supervision of Zayd ibn Thabit. And from that, seven copies or maybe nine copies were made. So from that Imam manuscript, seven or nine copies were made, and these copies were distributed all over the Muslim world at the time. And every Qur'an therefore had to be an exact replica, an exact copy of those Qur'ans. So we still have, according to many experts in the field, we still have two or three of those original manuscripts existing that was compiled in the time of Uthman ibn Affan, which is only some uh, 20 years after the death of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And as I said, you can go anywhere in the world today and you can take a copy of the Qur'an and you can compare it with one with Qur'ans anywhere and you can go back in history 300, 400, 500 years, and you can compare those Qur'ans then with the Qur'ans that we have today, and you will not find they are different, not by a word, not by a letter. So this is a fact. This is a fact, and this is really an astounding miracle of the Qur'an. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He said that verily we have revealed the dhikr, the reminder, and upon us is the preservation of it. So this is the way that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom has preserved the Qur'an. What is important here for the rest of our discussions in the series to come is of course that when we are referring to the Qur'an, we are referring to a document that is verified and certified to be authentic. It is something that we do not differ about. All the different Muslim sects, all of us, we agree upon one single text of the Qur'an. And we have agreed upon one single text of the Qur'an for 1,400 years. So this is a book that is preserved. This is a book that is authentic. This is a book that we can trust in and we can believe in. And this is, insha'Allah, what we will be discussing later in future programs. The next one is the oral preservation of the Qur'an. Until then, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon all of you.